I was on a beautiful street called Gold Hawk Road. <laughs> now, that's not good English. It should be Golden Hawk Road, shouldn't it? <laughs> Except maybe it's a person. We used to say in old English when I was young, when you sold someone or something, you hawked it. You were hawking things. Things that we now flog, we used to hawk. So a gold hawk is probably someone who sells gold, I would imagine. <laughs> but it is the most beautiful street full of cloth stores. And I want to talk about material. So I got some material. If, it, if my plan works, I'm going to look much shinier during this talk and much more bright. Hold on a moment. Isn't this beautiful? <laughs> and it's not expensive. This was three euros a meter. So far so good. <laughs> and the other is two euros a meter. Now this is really nice stuff, isn't it? Shiny, huh? Now we can talk about material more, uh, more brightly. Oh my. Mike went down. Did I do that with my cloth? Yes, I did. <laughs> this cloth is natural material. It's mostly made of petroleum, which is very natural. Petroleum is uh, rancid oil. And if you don't know what rancidity is, when butter gets old and bitter, when olive oil gets old and bitter, it is rancid. And how it gets rancid is a certain kind of bacteria-like thing. It's not a bacteria, it's a pre-bacteria of the Archaea family. What's he going to do? Oh, I thought he's going to, yeah, that's what he's going to do. <laughs> and it spoils butter and olive oil, or any kind of oil. Most especially, it spoils walnuts when you're at someone's house and they give you salad with walnuts, it's always spoiled walnuts. I don't know why. But they're very dangerous because they mess up your immune system for a day or even a week according to how rancid it is. Oh, that was a beautiful noise. When all sorts of plants and animals die, the oil over the years seeps into oil patches underground and this archaea prebacteria starts working on it and turns it into super poisonous rancid oil. So it's just rancid oil. We could do it ourselves if we had a whole lot of oil and a couple of millions of years, we could make our own petroleum. But so many of our clothes are now made of petroleum. So many of our shoes, everything that's plastic, our chairs, our telephones, are made of petroleum. Different kinds, polyvinyl chloride, which I've used in downstairs, this PVC pipe. It's polyvinyl chloride 
You could also make yourself, if you had the right place, it's petroleum and seawater. That's what it is. Only you put some color into it and make it bright colors or gray color if you like gray color. There are not any unnatural materials because there's natural materials and we might assume a concept of supernatural materials because that's what unnatural materials would be. We don't have any unnatural materials. We might have ridiculous, stupid ways of making and using material. That's quite different, isn't it? That's a quite different thing. That puts it onto us instead of onto the material. So the material is basically innocent. And it's our ways of doing things that are so crazy and strange. Now I'm to the gist of what I want to talk about. Crazy and strange. I was talking also earlier in the week with T.J. Demos, who is a, I don't know what he is, a thinker of some sort. But he said we need a new paradigm in the, in the entire world, but certainly in the art world. And I've been thinking similar things for, I suppose, all of my adult life. People often say to me, when did you realize you were an artist? I never have realized I was an artist. I started making art because I was writing poetry and I wasn't able to sell them. You go out on the street, would you like to buy this poem? They say no. And even if they did, they wouldn't pay much money for it. But I could make different kinds of sculptural things and make more money. The first thing I sold was in Houston, Texas in 65, I suppose, four or five. And I was, I was part of a theater group and I was carving wood and bone. And somebody said, that's really art, you should sell it. Isn't that a ridiculous combination of words? But I was doing theater and I had to work as a mechanic or a cowboy to make a living. And I didn't make much money. And I went to a gallery in a shopping mall and I put four things in and I sold one right away for $300. That was more than a week's salary for me, very hard work. So I said, art is really good, I love art. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a very bad idea of what art was, make things and sell them. A French friend of mine says, art to money, that's a bad translation. <laughs> but it's more and more a bad translation and more and more strange. But we have these categories. We have a category art, a category writing or books or literature, and we have a category, category called music. People often ask me, do you like music? What music do you like? You can't say what music you like. You can say, I like Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, but you can't say that you like Pakistani mu music because it's too big of a category, Pakistani music, or any other kind of music. If what they used to say in the 70s in the US when the hippies were in control of things, they said that plants liked classical music. And what they mean by classical music is European music of, say, the 16th century to the 19th century, of a certain type of European music. Not European music, certain type composed by paid composers for orchestras. And that is classical music. It can't be a good category. But 
They said that plants liked this music, and I am from the forest. And I thought, for 20,000 years, these poor trees have been suffering with Cherokee music and hating it. And I don't know why they didn't wilt. I don't know why they kept growing. <laughs> Maybe the category was wrong. But just the idea that you have a category is misleading. It's things that we have so that we can talk. It's not about reality. It's not about, uh, it's this very shorthand for how we can talk about things and we ought to know it as shorthand and unsatisfactory. In every case, we ought to know that. I actually dislike music. And I say this quite often, I hate music, I hate music. I cannot stay in my studio and work unless I have music playing. When my back is really bad, I can't walk, but if some reggae music is playing, I can dance down the street even though I can't walk. If there is a marching band playing, I'm ready to go kill the enemy. I'll start marching along. I really hate music. It's totally biological. And it grabs, your, grabs my body and does what it wants. That's not so nice. But I hate music exactly the same way I hate language. I want to communicate. I want to say something. And there are no languages that will say what I want to say. It's always a bad compromise. But language tells us that we use language to think. Language tells us we cannot think without language. All visual artists know that we can think without language. We know that our work is intellectual work, that you can, you can get something just like music is intellectual. If I listen to a symphony, as long as it's not Chicago or someplace, of playing a Beethoven's Sixth, uh, sixth symphony, symphony, I get a great intellectual meaning from this. But it's not in language, it's in music. It's in the intellectual meaning is in the music, not in an interpretation of the music. So. I bet no one ever asked any musician, what does that mean? <laughs> what is it supposed to represent? We know music as music, but the category is ridiculous. The category is really stupid because we don't mean music, except I do when I say I hate it, I really mean that. When someone tells me they love music, I know that they don't love music. And every time I talk about this, I sing a song, and it's in my brain, never leaves. Do I keep doing this, or does it do itself that way? It's a music commercial on the radio in the U.S. at Christmas time. They were selling Norelco electric shavers, and these shavers have four little cutting heads that are flexible, so they call them floating heads. And the jingle to sell these Norelco shavers at Christmas time is floating heads, floating heads, floating all the way. This for a child, this is not nice, is it? This is, this is something really too bad. <laughs> I am very sensitive to music and I hear, yikes, I'm exposed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's not so easy to wear these things. <laughs> I know so many bad songs. My brain loves bad music. And I'm wanting to work, and my brain says, why don't we hum this song? and it starts with some stupid, stupid Christian hymn or something even worse, some English 
the nursery song. <laughs> I learned this song when I was a child. I'm going to sing one more time and then I won't sing anymore. Oh, don't you remember it was a long time ago? There were two little children, their names I don't know. They were walking along on a long summer's day. Got lost in the woods, I heard people say. And the poor little babies, they cried and they cried. And finally they lay down and died. And a pretty little robin flew down from the trees and covered them over with strawberry leaves. And he sang and he sang for the whole summer's long over two little babes who'd never done wrong. That's also not a nice song for a child to learn, is it? <laughs> <laughs> My disguise is going away. My the microphone is falling. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe, uh, maybe this way. Maybe this works better. Then I can hold it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can fix it a bit here. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> now, I, I had a... <laughs> I had a couple of strokes a little more than a year ago, so I'm blind on my right-hand side. So I see this with my left eye, but I, or with both eyes, but I don't see it on the right. Because I don't see anything over here, but here I see it, and I see that it's probably covering up my right side, which, okay, it's not my best side anyway, but <laughs> it's not so easy to give this kind of lecture. <laughs> More complicated than I thought. <laughs> when we say literature, we mean because of this silly shorthand, we mean writing good books. And what we mean by good books is the books that we like. There is very important intellectual criterion for writing good, intellectual, intelligent, disciplined writing. And this discipline doesn't have to look like discipline. It can look like uh, something even stranger than James Joyce. But it has to be serious. The category literature, or books, or writing, is a ridiculous category. It's a totally false category. And no matter which words we use, we are misleading ourselves and misleading each other when we use these words. Do you like books? No, I don't like Mein Kampf. I think it's a bad book. I don't like, it. let me start over. I don't like most books these days because there are so many books. There are so many writers writing so many books and there is such a distribution system so that every department store, every airport, every bus station, train station has two or three thousand paperback books for you to read. They're mostly horrible, bad things that you should not read. They're bad for us. They're just stupid and they're written for making money out of our wish to be stupid. <laughs> I don't like the idea of art, I don't like the idea of artist, but how to talk about this false category. This is what T.J. Demos is on about. How do we change these categories and get, as he says, a new paradigm for our lives in general, for this crisis that we're in? 
but especially to me for art, because I, I try my best to make intelligent things for intelligent people. I try to make things for people smarter than me, because if I make things for people just as smart as me, it seems like being in a pub and talking bar talk, just joking, everybody's joking with each other and never saying anything important, never saying anything that might change anybody. If I make art, as so many people have always done, for people who are less smart than me, it means I think I'm the smart guy and I will do something smart. That's not good for people to think that way. You can't make anything good that way, whether you call it art or not. But if I make art for the smartest people, and I don't know who they are, I don't know where they are, they can be anyone on the street. They don't have to be educated. Or it's better if they're not so miseducated, I think I might say, if they're not so miseducated as we are. We went yesterday to the Tate Britain and we saw a folk art show. It was horrible. It was English folk art. It was so stupid. And this other guy I met today, he said, what a strange, unfortunate thing in these days when Great Britain and England are trying so hard to deny their current reality to make a show of English folk art as though it were, I don't know what, as though it were uh, some way English, as though it were ur English and the rest of us are not English. <laughs> the rest of us, all these people over here, they're not even English. <laughs> Italian, American, who knows what all. <laughs> Foreigners. <laughs> but the show lumped many things together, as I knew it would, and the most energyless group of things they found the most insipid things and they put them out all together and it's called folk art. Now, some of them were quite beautiful and stunning and some of them were made as art. Some of them were made as paintings. Alfred Wallace's work was made as paintings in the 1920s. And why is it folk art? Why would he be a folk painter? And what would a folk painter be? And what would be the opposite kind of painter and a folk painter? I read many years ago in the 60s a Polish art critic who said the opposite of folk art would be gentry art. Because those two words, there's the folk and there's the gentry. So, if there is folk art, then there is gentry art. Not fine art. And even the museums know that. There are fine art museums who got stuck in a certain place and they can't take the things that people want to see, so they have to make a new museum <coughs> called contemporary art, and then that gets a little old and in places like Belgium, they have to make a Hedendagse Kunst Museum and so on and so on. We can't keep up with uh, what goes on in the world with art because it's a stupid category. If I say these categories, music, writing, art, are unhealthy for us, it doesn't mean that I have some idea of better categories or that I have suggestions on how to get rid of the categories. I think we are stuck with them in so many ways, but I think, like T.J. Demos, they're coming unwound. 
they're not working. They're not good anymore. The French like to say, like to say the more things change, the more they stay the same. But I know it's not true. I know we do change because I spent six months in Venice and if you spend any time in Venice, out in the back streets there's rather small courtyards. In these courtyards, even in the 1830s, let's say, they had once every few months entertainment, especially for the people who lived in the apartments with their children, and they would bring in a bull and a bunch of bulldogs to torture the bull to death. And they don't do that now. <laughs> they did that and they brought their little children to watch this happening over and over and over. The children laughed, they were excited, they were afraid, terrorized, and they laughed. The British Isles tortured bulls and cows to death every time they wanted to kill the cow for food, every time they wanted beef. Up until the 1850s, it was the law. The bull or the cow had to be tortured to death with bulldogs. That's why there are bulldogs, to torture these animals to death. And the reason was they thought the adrenaline made the meat taste better. I say it, you think, oh, how could that be? How could that possibly be? There are many worse things that have been done around, and we don't do them anymore. The Spanish still like to torture bulls, but even some of the Spanish say, let's stop doing this, let's not do it anymore. Other Spanish say, yes, this is our tradition. Well, we're in a place now in the world where we really have to make another change, like we did when we developed writing. My family wasn't personally involved in this, but uh, humans developed writing, and humans developed uh, all these things that made great big changes in our lives. Great big changes, railroads maybe even. Capitalism is not working and even money is not working very well, it is so strong with us. I cannot imagine how we would do without it. If we imagine uh, something like uh, a barter system, well, that's just money, isn't it? And sooner or later, we'd have to get a more sophisticated barter system and we'd be right back in the same place we are now. But this capitalist system we have is everybody says is a scam, it's like a Ponzi scheme, it's a dirty trick, and sooner or later it won't work. There's nothing we can do about it, any of us, but we can, I think, have an interesting time thinking about these things because things are changing and things change because people think about them. I make a lot of different things that are now called art and shorthand. I love material. I love to work with material and I love to make things. And when I'm making things, like a sculpture it might be called, it is very generative. It makes me think of other things I can make. It gives me the energy of thinking about things to make. So it works and works for making things. I tell my students, this is very bad. Don't trust that. This makes sentimental art most of the time. And so many of my students always want to say, I make art because I love to make art, or I love art, mm. or I make art for myself. You don't even read a book for yourself. You don't do things for yourself, you do things socially. If you read a book, 
You read it so you will be more in the world, so that you will have more knowledge to be in the world. More, I mean, not the knowledge that's in the book, but the knowledge that comes from you reading this book. <coughs> the same with music, the same with art. So if we, what is Lamont Young? That's his name. Lamont Young is a composer. Uh, I don't even see when this happens, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was talking along and no one was hearing me, were they? <laughs> Good. Lamont Young makes a very special kind of music and he says, I like stupid music and I would always rather listen to schmaltzy music. So I try to compose music better than the music I like. I'm not sure that it works with Lamont, but that's what I want to do, except I don't do it most of the time. Most of the time I make things crazily because I love to. This does not make good art. This makes self-indulgent usually sentimental art. I just hope not always. And I also like to make art where I don't make anything. Where I get a car and I put a great big stone on top of the car or an airplane and put an a great big stone on the airplane. Then I haven't made anything. It makes me feel so sophisticated makes me feel like a real artist. <laughs> Almost as good as uh, one of the conceptual artists. Can you imagine the category called conceptual art? What is it? Does that mean that there is no material involved at all? So that, oh, I never even remember his name. He's a little younger than me, but he acts older and he's got a great big long beard. A conceptual artist who's Lawrence Wiener. He makes conceptual art. What if he didn't use any material to make his art? What if he didn't use any surface and put any paint or graphite on the surface? Because he does words on surfaces. What if he said, okay, I'll, I'll make conceptual art. I won't put painted words on surfaces. I will just think words. <laughs> I won't say them out of my material vocal cards. I'll just think them. He wouldn't get much money, would he? <laughs> and he wouldn't get much feedback either. <laughs> so I don't know why we have this category, conceptual art, and I don't know why we then think it is so much more sophisticated than uh, whatever might be the opposite PVC art, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I don't trust any of my ways of making art, and I want to be a serious artist. What I mean by being a serious artist, I do write poetry, I do write essays and other kinds of things. I am a poet, therefore, but there would be a whole lot of English people who would and do say that it's not real poetry that I write. Because there is an English idea and a European idea of what poetry is, that there is a strict definition of poetry, that it has certain kinds of stanzas and rhymes at the end. This is such a dumb, stupid trick, isn't it? Poetry that rhymes. And most of the world knows it's a stupid trick. And most of the world never thought to make poetry that rhymes. The other criteria are there. Not rhyming the end of things so that it becomes like a commercial radio jingle that you can remember. 
I like to put words in strange orders to kind of force language to do something that it forces me back, that I have a dance of force with me in language. And I like to do the same thing with objects. If I do it with language, they of a certain size, and I can publish them if I call them poetry. So it's just a shorthand. It's not a lie, it's just a shorthand. It's the same with sculpture. I make art, and sometimes I make paintings. I'm trying to force the material. At the same time, I want the material to force me to do something that has intellectual meaning. I think all of these endeavors that we call writing, music, and art, they're intellectual activities. They're not uh, whatever instinctive might mean, instinctual activities. I can't do any work without my instincts, but I want my intellect involved in everything I do. I know it doesn't seem that way. I can't keep my veil on. I can't keep my thoughts together. But that's the way I would like to live my life. And I don't know if I explained anything by all this or not, but I don't have anything more to say. And if we have a little time, if anybody wants to say something back to me, they could. But, the, uh, yeah, yikes, I'm about to say the moment of truth. It's me, it's me. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you all very much for coming.